Hello. <laughs> Near the entrance, along the left wall stood a big tin tank that looked like a bath covered with a thin iron grating, filled with water to the depth of two inches. In this shallow pool was kept a huge crocodile which lay like a log, absolutely motionless, and apparently deprived of all its faculties by our damp climate. So inhospitable to foreign visitors. This monster at first aroused no special interest in any one of us. That's Dostoevsky writing in 1865 in the story The Crocodile, a wonderful fable about greed and capitalism the image of Europe in St. Petersburg in that time, but I won't go deeper into that now. It was to uh, introduce my title. I'd like to start from uh, things that are at hand, newspaper clippings especially, things that we uh, find in the world outside rather than things that belong only to art. And I'll do this uh, in, in a somewhat arbitrary fashion, so let the materials guide my thought process rather than uh, come up with a theory in advance. At the same time, I must say that my gaze is also formed by art and culture, by reading philosophy, literature, etc., which also allows me and allows us to recognize certain things. So there's a literacy that, that is also received through art. How can we have attention and perhaps care for things we don't know yet, or even for things that we might never know or understand. So my guide today is the crocodile, or better, the crocodile as it appears in the newspaper, in literature and film, and ultimately in the theater, because that's also the place we're sharing here right now. I'll be talking about the crocodile as a trope, so as a motif that has a history, and opens up a particular imaginary, imaginary realm, it symbolizes certain things, so there's a what involved. It has a tropological function, so in literature, and by extension a dramaturgical function within a text or image, and within culture at, li at large. So not only what, but how does it symbolize certain things? How does it play a role in managing our attention? And since an animal cannot be simply reduced to a cultural technology, does it perhaps feature in an ecology of attention and indicate its limits? So these are a few questions I'd like to touch upon through um, talking to some materials. Exactly a week ago, on the cover of the Flemish newspaper The Standaard, there was this uh, article. Cayman tax leaves black capital undisturbed. So the Cayman tax is a popular name for the so-called transparency tax in Belgium on foreign financial constructions that allow for disguising big capital and avoiding tax. So it aims at so-called tax paradises as Luxembourg, Liechtenstein or the Cayman Islands. And I find it interesting that um, the popular name is not the Liechtenstein tax but the Cayman tax. So how come that this tax became associated with the, the Cayman, an animal that appears to symbolize the opposite of transparency. There are regularly short items, so-called fait or in this case perhaps animodiver. So stories about a newborn giraffe in the zoo, a scientist studying zebrafish, or many casualties and events that involve crocodiles. So these animals seem to have, or these animal stories seem to have a function in the newspaper. So a, bright, a broad variety of topics contributes to an ecology of attention, of readership. And this is why readers are also treated on a daily basis with miscellaneous articles about animals 
and plants, which literalizes somehow the idea of a, a biodiversity also within, uh, within topics. A year ago, there was a, a small clipping, it's this one, about the Guardian, Guardian journalist Grant Greenwald, who published a book about the secret uh, surveillance programs, prison, in Britain and the US, that were revealed to him by whistleblower Edward Snowden in 2012. And the article describes what will become the central plot of at least one film. I quote, the encounter between Greenwald and Snowden at a plastic crocodile in a five-star hotel in Hong Kong is already a classic, unquote. So this crocodile statue of the Mira Hotel in, in Hong Kong is much discussed on the internet, but there is no image to be found. So I'm, fortunately I can't show it, but it only heightens its uh, potential for the imaginary. And so I'm very curious for all these films about uh, the whistleblower that will come out and might feature or not this plastic crocodile. Yet, yeah, in my quest, and when I insisted too much um, on finding this image, Google went blank and refused to show me more results. Or take this clipping. A story in a weekend magazine about the luxury handbags of Hermes. Also one in uh, Crocodilus porosus. And it's actually one of the bags similar to the one uh, worn by Kate Blanchett's character in Blue Jasmine, the Woody Allen movie. It's just an example of, um, well, the highly instrumentalized plays that animals have in our society. <laughs> but it speaks also to me, this particular clipping, about the gentrification of the imagination, which is, to me, a very interesting problem we need to discuss when we go outside. Um, the cities are far more that we live in, are rather infested by advertisement, project, project developers, and so on, and, and what they do to the, what the capital also does to the imagination, rather than by wild animals. Um, now this clipping brought me somewhere else to a, a story of Bruno Schulz, the Polish writer from 1934, called The Street of Crocodiles. And in this story, Schulz aims to describe the uncharted and, and dubious district in a city, unnamed city, where the scum, the corrupt, and the morally deserted gather, but also explore the promises of modern life. I quote, the best among them were not entirely free from the temptation of voluntary degradation, of breaking down the barriers of hierarchy, of immersion in that shallow mud of companionship, of easy intimacy, of dirty intermingling." Unquote. So his description throughout his story seeks a promise in the open-ended and slippery, in the performativity of the formless, which allows for dark desires and unfamiliar passions to thrive. But then the narrator has to conclude that his hopes were too high, as they're overtaken by a reality that we now, today, would call gentrification. Quote, the street of crocodiles was a concession of our city to modernity and metropolitan corruption. Obviously, we were unable to afford anything better than a paper imitation, a montage of illustrations cut out from last year's smoldering newspapers. Unquote. In the literary pages in August 2014 was a small article about the Autonauts of the Cosmo Route, a book uh, written by Julio Cortazar and Carol Dunlop in 1982. And uh, a journalist revisited their trip. So what they were doing, they were traveling from Paris to Marseille along the Autoroute du Soleil and visited each parking lot, picnic area, uh, gas station, motel, and so on. And it took them uh, several months, so they did two stops a day. And they wrote a report about it. 
these reborn travel writers look at their own living environment like travelers of interstitial zones. With the gaze of an astronaut, they explore, for instance, the urban jungle, or they explore Parking Landia. Now leaving the Air de Montelimar, the journalist uh, spots a sign that probably wasn't there 30 years ago. Ferme au crocodile, crocodile farm. And he adds, it's unclear whether this is a warning or an invitation. So I got curious and uh, revisited also the book of Cortesar and Dunlop, which comes with wonderful uh, drawings and travel logs. So here is the uh, Air de Montelimar. And this is the report made that day of uh, what they did. And Cortesar writes, so in the story that follows, he mentions a conversation with a, a cryptozoologist who provides proof of the existence of the monster of Loch Ness. Then he speaks about breakfast in the scant shade of a rather mutant little tree, followed by the sighting of a perfect glass sphere in the 11 a.m. blue morning air, not unlike a UFO sighting. Quote, so as Nessie is in her lake, that sphere is in some part of the sky. Since last night, we've become part of a no man's land of reality, and now things like this happen as naturally as any other event of the trip." Unquote. So the travelogue doesn't indicate a sign, fermo crocodile, yet it mentions an illegible phrase. And I thought, how come was this phrase just illegible, or did it disappear otherwise? And what about the sign? So in a story written uh, more than a decade earlier from in, in 1969, it becomes clear that Cortasai was actually highly acquainted with that uh, region, the Auvergne. He wrote a story about it, titled Regarding the Eradication of Crocodiles from Auvergne. In the first place, no one has ever admitted seeing a crocodile in Auvergne, so that from the start, any attempt to exterminate them is surrounded with difficulties. The story discusses the problem it poses for governors and administrators of that region, and their lack of decisiveness in that matter forms an alliance with the reticent behavior of local farmers. Obviously, the crocodiles have taken advantage of these psychoeconomic circumstances to multiply and proliferate freely throughout Auvergne. So the story is written in the exuberant prose of bureaucracy, and Cortasar seems to, su to suggest that it is the crocodiles infesting the Auvergne region that bereaves their inhabitants of speech. The crocodiles are not just taciturn brooding creatures that symbolize the dark corners of corruption, foods, and secrecy. They actually devour language and culture to install a regime of silence. From the obstinate silence, so, quote, from an obstinate silence that follows these bloody disputes, the psychologists have drawn the conclusion that the true culprits were crocodiles and that the personal accusations came from the desire to feign an ignorance that in the end benefits no one, unquote. The story also comes with wonderful drawings like this in the margins. Now, the next travel log um, is the Air de Pierre Lat. And over here you see also a nuclear power plant that actually was already there in 1982. It was built there in uh, 1980, so it's freshly opened. And I realized I had met this power plant before in a film of Werner Herzog, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams from 2000. Then, the film reflects on the, the oldest known grotto paintings in the cave of Chauvet, and they're about 32,000 years old. And Herzog reflects on this in the youngest mass medium, uh, the 3D film, which he deliberately uses in, in a poor way, in line with his claim and his poetics that we don't have adequate imagery of today's civilization, let alone of tomorrow's. And this resonates also with the question of, of Maximilian Haas, 
uh, what is this need today also of um, contemporary images and new images of, uh, of animals? Um, yeah, a central question in the film is how can we communicate into the future via images? Also on a geological, geological time scale, 32,000 years old. And then in a, in a postscript, Herzog takes a leap into the faraway future, and that's where he meets this uh, albino crocodile. So, so the grotto paintings constitute a memory of the ways in which mankind adapted itself to its environment and related to animals, plants, and landscape. And in the postscript, he suggests Herzog in a disconcerting way that within several millennia, there will remain animals as a living archive of our civilization and possibly also an innocent projection screen, a paradoxical byproduct of te technological and cultural waste. So this albino crocodile lives in a 30 kilometers from Chauvet, uh, together with 350 crocodiles in this crocodile farm, Fermo Crocodile, mentioned by the journalist, not known yet by Cortesar because it wasn't there yet, or that's unsure. They live in a tropical glasshouse complex, which is nurtured and fed by the, the cooling water of this nuclear power plant, hence the mutants. So, and uh, Herzog says about this moment in the film, soon these albinos might reach the Chauvet cave, looking at the paintings so of their predecessors, at that point perhaps 15,000 years old, 50,000 years old, looking at the paintings, what will they make of them? Nothing is real, nothing is certain. I'd like to come back to some of the questions I addressed in the beginning, or that I brought up, and the, the idea of a limit, and how to recognize certain things that we don't understand, that we don't know. And another philosopher who wrote famously about grotto paintings is Georges Bataille in Lascaux, La Naissance de l'Art, so the birth of, of art in 1955. And yeah, he says, okay, animals linger on the edge of our language-ridden world, and they remind us of that which we don't understand, and thus of art's very beginning. So it's a kind of primal scene described by Bataille when looking at the earliest grotto paintings. So by shedding his animalistic nature, man lost according to Bataille, the glory of the beast, for which he sought compensation in the transgressive practices of art and play. Now, which horiz horizon of meaning can animal in the arts open up for us today? And this is an interesting image of, um, of Herzog because it indicates also the future of the image of art and of mankind in relation to ecology, to the poverty of imagination, to cultural wastes, culture and technology, Etc. So animals do indicate the limits of culture and understanding, as well they, as they put a, a limit to the, our sense of superiority. And it's it's a quite complex image that uh, I wanted to juxtapose with Bataille. I'll move on to literature, or continue in that field. In the book Vertigo of W.G. Sebald, uh, Schwindelgefühle, from 1990, the author, or his alter ego, makes a train trip from Vienna to Venice, and he has Franz Gilpatz's Italian Diary with him, a book written in 1819. Sebald's alter ego paraphrases Gilpatza, I quote, despite its delicately crafted arcades and turrets, he wrote, the Dodge's palace in Venice was inelegant and reminded him of a crocodile. What put this comparison into his head, he did not know. The resolutions passed here by the Council of State must truly be mysterious, immutable and harsh, he observed, calling the palace an enigma in stone. The nature of that enigma was apparently dread, 
And for as long as he was in Venice, Grill Paatse could not shake off a sense of the uncanny. Trained in law himself, he dwelt on that palace where the legal authorities resided and in the inmost cavern of which, as he put it, the invisible principle brooded, <coughs> unquote. With this quote, I'd like to um, introduce this notion of the, the tropological function. So from the what, moving from the what to the how. So what does the crocodile, uh, this tasty turn, enigmatic creature symbolize? So far we've met greed and capitalism, intransparency, secrecy, corruption, moral desertion, bureaucracy, but also more abstractly, enigma, ineffable futures, the invisible principle, unfamiliar desires, etc. And this mostly in an ambiguous fashion, holding also a dark promise. So how does it symbolize what it symbolizes? Bruno Schulz in the story The Street of Crocodiles points at the failure of, of language that is always too stiff to get hold of this uh, slippery, uh, formless reality he's looking for. Herzog points at the ina inadequacy of images. Sebald points at the unclear origin of the comparison. So the stone palace as a crocodile indicating an invisible principle that seems to be brooding in it. The formless, the ineffable, the in unimaginable. How can we give them a place within the field of cultural intelligibility? So this is the field in which we use language and images as a means of expression, communication, and imagination without actually making them transparent. The trope, so the figure of speech, though I've started with the trope as a, as a motif. The trope as a figure of speech, metaphor, has I think three related functions. So trope comes from tropos in, in ancient Greek, which means turn, way, or manner. And tropes deviate from customary language in order to generate figures of speech or thought by making unexpected connections between heterogeneous elements, so twining together different strands. And thus they twist, in a way you could say, also accepted versions of reality and allow us to explore the unfamiliar. Coming back to this problem of recognition without understanding, this is the second point. The trope also harbors in its discursive materiality that which cannot be made transparent or visible or tangible as such. So the opacity operates in an obstinate remainder, as if it were transferred to the heavy embodiment of language itself, to its thickness and opacity. This opacity of things in the world we don't understand, but also blind spots in ourself and in our relation to this world. This image I put here is um, a monument. It's a sculpture of Chris, the largest crocodile that was ever caught and shot in 1957, and later on erected in a stone um, version. The hunter who shot the animal later became an activist. But I, I'd like to, uh, to hold on to this idea of the crocodile in stone and its, its embodiment that is slightly too heavy. And we can imagine that the trope to function also as a, a monument of sorts. So what monuments do is they give things that are partly opaque or unimaginable to us a symbolic place within culture, as opposed to the expressive sign. So monuments, they are hardly language or image, yet they have a weighty place in the public area, and they relieve us from our lack of imagination, lack of empathy, grief, etc. Now I'm moving briefly to, uh, to cinema, though it's not so easy to convey the complexity of that medium um, within a lecture. But I'm interested in this shift 
holding all the questions that I've discussed so far in mind, as a medium that is a popular medium, that still plays a relatively important role in the cultural imagination, and to move from the trope to dramaturgy, that's also to structuring of narrative, of time and space, and also a more literal approach to the crocodile as a motif and a trope. Because a film quite literally provides imagery of animals and plants, affording pathways that structure our attention as a, a conceptual landscape of sorts. And uh, yet we remain in the realm of the trope. The crocodile as it lives in art and culture is a different animal than we would meet um, in real life if we ever come across one. So I'm interested to, to explore this notion of the conceptual landscape to arrive at the ecology of attention. I made a few film stills just to uh, suggest some alligators and, and crocodiles that populate the uh, history of cinema. This is an alligator that does not only live in uh, an herpetologist's textbook or in urban myths, yet comes alive in the slippery and dank sewers of Chicago, feeding on hormone bred dog carcasses and other waste of the metropolis, growing out of proportion and then moving out into the open to bite back the citizens of the city with its dark energy in Alligator from 1980. Or take James Bond, when asked him to live and let die in 1973, how much he knows about crocodiles. He replies, oh, I've always tried to keep them, them at arm's length myself. Or more recently, in Lee Daniels' black exploitation movie, The Paperboy, from 2012, in which we follow a reporter penetrating to the swamps of Florida to meet a crocodile hunter and realize that the animal's evisceration doesn't reveal anything about the case he is investigating, save for the fact that a crew of intermingled secrets and dark desires best thrives. Yes, where actually? This notion of the conceptual landscape, I'd like to develop in relation to the, the cinema of Alfred Hitchcock and his principle or notion of the MacGuffin. Something that drives the plot and the attention in a film without actually meaning much. It seems to mean everything to the, the protagonists and the characters in the film, but not to the spectators, really. At the same time, the interpretation of the MacGuffin as, as what drives the plot is too narrow for me because a lot of Hitchcock's work is not just plot-driven, but it navigates its way through objects and images, through movements such as, as walking also, and a good deal of nothingness. So he seems to construct conceptual landscapes in that sense. Um, his first movie that explores this notion um, is The 39 Steps of 1935. I don't have a, a still of it, but... Um, I can suggest a few elements that start with also the spectator walking into the image to explore that landscape. In the opening scene, the 39 steps, we follow the male protagonist walking into a theater, only by shots of his legs and his back, which is nothing else than an invitation for us to walk into the film. And now that we're walking, Hitchcock makes us also travel by train to the Scottish, Scottish countryside and take a walk there, populating the landscape with a flock of sheep and other animals. Back in London, the landscape also pervades the urban jungle. When our man escapes Scotland Yard at some point, ends up on the stage of a political meeting and has to improvise his way through a speech, he looks down at his paper, which happens to be turned upside down, and wondering which politician he's actually introducing, enthusiastically calls out his name but then has to apologize for nicknaming him and after realizing he hadn't quite made out the uh, man's proper name from the paper that actually reads Mr. McCorkadale. Another recent film is Spike John's adaptation written by uh, 
the screenplay writer Charlie Kaufman, who wrote himself also into this uh, into the script. It's a movie that speaks a great deal about um, well adapting or, or writing a film and structuring attention. But um, it's about this uh, scriptwriter Charlie Kaufman, also named Kaufman in, in the in the movie, who doesn't quite manage to turn the life of flowers. That's the book he's supposed to uh, to adapt into a compelling script, and then spurred on by his twin brother Donald Kaufman, eventually ends up following the famous middle-aged journalist Susan Orlean, who wrote the book he's supposed to adapt for the screen, and who had hoped for her loneliness would perish and passion flower upon finding the ghost orchid somewhere in a swamp in Florida, but actually became addicted to sniffing a green powder derived from the plant, and moreover sees her beloved orchid hunter John LaRoche being bitten to death by an alligator. And then Charlie Kaufman witnesses all this and even loses his brother in the adventure, but at last has managed to write a sense of biodiversity into his film. So speaking about conceptual landscapes and biodiversity, in the end we're not just talking about concepts, nor about crocodiles as a dramaturgical device or technology of attention. So even though we're not quite moving out in the open, we need to acknowledge another limit. We're talking about an animal and about, and about nature that will always resonate along in the trope. Um, the crocodile in this case. So what's the ecology part in our quest for recognition without understanding? <coughs> Werner Herzog is a filmmaker who regularly, regularly speaks about mental landscapes. And I quote him in relation to an early film, but the quote could apply to a lot of his, uh, of his work. The opening credits of Signs of Life from 1968 hold for an unusually long time with a single shot of a mountain valley. It gives you time to really climb deep inside the landscapes and for them to climb inside you. It shows that these are not just literal landscapes you're looking at, but landscapes of the mind too, unquote. Now I like to turn this idea the other way around. So rather than projecting one's own mind into these landscapes, we might wonder at what point does the literal overpower our mental landscapes and hunger for allegory. So when does the, the crocodile, in our case, insist also as an opaque trope, as an object, and ultimately as an animal that has a right in itself and a life of its own? And what kind of relationality does it then provoke? Another film of Werner Herzog is uh, his film Bad Lieutenant Port of Call New Orleans from 2009, which is really a mainstream film about uh, a cop with unconventional methods. Um, shortly after the shot, shortly after the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and yeah, this is an accident halfway the movie with an alligator. It's a clash of perspectives, and between whom does it just symbolize? Uh, certain stories and issues going on in the film, and or or not. And when we start to ponder the meaning of the scene too much in the film, Herzog's camera already moves into the ditch, where another living alligator, alligator is looming, and just walks out of the image and the camera, and us follow it out of the image into a different realm. And indeed, in that film. And it seemed that Herzog is turning his own idea of the mental landscape upside down. The true protagonists are the many living animals that populate the image. Snakes, liguanas, fish, a dog, alligators, and so on. And in that film, they don't have an allegorical place. Although they do indicate the limits of a human perspective. And even though Herzog has composed the film, these animals create an ecology of attention, I would suggest. So, let's say, an effective regime that is also apersonal, non-imaginary, non-symbolic, and thus installs a particular relationality. And then again, we should ask, with the image, so with the images of animals, or also with these animals, what does this mean?
I'd like to end with a, a brief statement or question around this to, to link back also to the, to the lecture of Maximilian Haas. So since man and animal don't share language, there is no understanding of each other's umwelt, uh, with Jakob von Uxkul, let alone a mutual understanding. But even though we don't have access to these multiple worlds of other beings, they do exist and impose limits upon our relationality and sense of superiority. Animals speak to us and they don't speak to us, which is not unlike a work of art that speaks to us and doesn't speak to us. So the paradoxical promise of the animal in the arts appears more complex if we add up all the, the functions I've been describing. And um, I'm slightly reluctant to borrow an argument of Fancian Depré and, and Donna Haraway, because they write actually about interspecies relations, not about relating to anim um, images of animals, but I propose it anyway for discussion. So through the animal that slumbers in us, we can unfold our bodies in the imaginary realm and thus become more fully human. That means a becoming that decenters us and inevitably also means a becoming with, and so a becoming heterogeneous or becoming worldly. And to end, a brief evocation of Miguel Gomez's film Taboo from 2012, Portuguese, Portuguese filmmaker who, who made a beautiful film, uh, a story of memory and trauma placed in contemporary Lisbon, half of it, and the other half 50 years ago in an imaginary Portuguese colony. It's a story of adultery, loss and grief about the taboos of the colonial past and so on. And it involves also a crocodile as a symbol and as a protagonist and animal actor. Now I'd like to read a brief passage of the prologue, which ends, um, this is an image from, uh, from this prologue, set in even a different time, also in a colony, but in an imaginary time, where we find a man roaming the jungle grieving his beloved wife. I quote, a crocodile awaits its moment, submerged in murky waters. The intrepid explorer is well aware he will meet his destiny in this river. His man witnessed the horror. The explorer bids farewell to life. Night falls in the savanna, as will a thousand and one nights more. Then and ever since, despite how absurd this may sound to men of reason, some swear to have witnessed this ghoulish sight a sad and melancholy crocodile with a lady from days gone by, inseparable pair united by a mysterious pact, never broken by death." Unquote. Thank you. So I think we have like 15 minutes, a bit more left of a discussion. The idea was that we have like a few short questions between the two of, of us here in front, but then we would like to also have your comments and questions on what you heard. Um, and there's also a microphone, so David will be around with a microphone and hand it to you so, so that everybody can hear you well. To begin with, maybe, um, I mean, the crocodile is a very specific animal. I mean, in terms of like size and not shape, but size, it's even anthropomorphic, at least some of those, but still it's really a, uh, an animal with which you would hardly identify, actually, because it's creepy, because it's somehow more like an insect that has grown way too big, or, I mean, it's, I think it's uh, on, a, on, a, on the verge of, uh, of um, being this kind of animal that actually also, 
I mean, in, in, in the sense of the quote that you gave, like Donna Haraway spoke about, I mean, it's, I mean, of course, you have all those interior small animals that kind of make you live, but there is also a specific kind of animal with which you can actually invent a certain way of practice or a certain communication. I hardly believe that it's possible with a crocodile. That's also I th what interests me here, I think, in a sense that um, the crocodile functions as a quasi-object, you could say, or at least in a dramaturgical sense, a foreign object that will always remain foreign. And in that sense, it's, it's very resistant as a trope. That's also why I brought up this idea of a, a monumental relation um, as a way of not relating to understanding or empathy or identification, whether it be affective or, or mental or so on, but to a merely symbolical relation. And in that sense, I find it interesting that this crocodile seems to have that function in very many films and literature. And you couldn't, for instance, construct the same argument with the rhinoceros or the, or the hippopotamus, which are also heavy animals that we are scared of and so on. But so it's intriguing to me that looking at even just a few materials, this image comes to the foreground. But funnily, there is also like this fugitive image in the in the Herzog film, or I mean, what you say perfectly connects to the to the monument to this extremely extremely huge crocodile that is actually reproduced in stone, which makes it like even bigger, thicker, or uh, you, you use another word like thickness and op 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 opacity of, <coughs> of the symbol, which is like perfectly embodied in that sculpture in this monument. But in the film, it's funny how also I mean it's. It comes out of nothing. I mean, there's like this regular thing going on, like Hollywood cinema in a way, and then <laughs> swoosh, it, it, it goes into the most unlikely perspective, one could say, I mean. Yeah, totally, and at the same time, it's also a small monument, because indeed he, he does name this particular albino crocodile that lives in that particular place, so he gives it a, a name and a place in, in cultural history, which is maybe not unlike um, yeah, the particularity of one animal on stage that you also addressed. I don't know whether we can compare this, but... Uh and it's always, so, of course, like the, the southern states of the US, it's always like uncanny and the spooky. It's, it's always like, also in the realm of voodoo, you know? <laughs> Thinking about like, a true detective or, I mean, that is the place where you would like expect actually the crocodile. Questions, comments? David? Hello? Yeah. Uh, thank you for both lectures and actually just a couple of comments. Uh, one for Jeroen has to do with the, the kind of archive of films that you brought up, which are quite elegant and, and evoke, uh, like Herzog and Hitchcock. And then I was thinking about the figure of the crocodile hunter, right? Crocodile Dundee. And I'm thinking of how obnoxiously obscene that film is somehow. And then I was thinking how elegantly you put together the crocodile as a kind of avatar for both colonialism and capitalism, right? Now, then I was thinking about Crocodile Dundee as actually representing you know, the neoliberal globalization of the, let's say, <laughs> the adventurous capitalist that comes out of this kind of colonial elsewhere in order to kill the beast or control the beast, but actually has always, the hunter always has to become the beast somehow. So this kind of ongoing relationship between the hunter and the animal, the crocodile hunter, and as it has to become crocodile somehow. So, so this is one, one way of thinking about it. And then just the other one was this beautiful moment in Maximian's uh, presentation where in the Bresson film, something takes place, which is the, I mean, w w one way of thinking about a counter example of Derrida would be to think about Carly Schneeman's films in which she basically has sex with her cat. Like once the cat comes, she's naked, they make love, which is fantastic, right? So wondering about like the, the kind of, um, 
modesty of the masculine or the male philosopher in relationship to the, to the animal. So this, what is that kind of interpolation? And then the other question is how do, in the Bresson film, what happens when animals gaze to each other? That I, I hadn't understood. I, I find it quite beautiful, like this interpolation between animals in which the human seems to be um, just like an excess or supplement. That's all. I mean, just to comment shortly on the last point, I think that is really, I mean, it's, it's a change of perspective that for me t took very long to actually do because, I mean, as I said and think that the, the, the word animal is actually anthropological, it's, it's a word that actually uh, defines us in relation to the animal or the vice versa, I mean, you can only become truly like ecologically, e ecolo e ecological in your thinking once you recognize that there is not only the relation of you to whatever, but whatever has a relation to whatever too. And this is also the, 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 the beautiful like invitation by, uh, by Uxku to actually see that every an individual animal has a subjective perspective and uh, there is one intersection with the world that is ours, which he calls Umgebung. Um, and, but there are millions of others to other Umwelts that we can hardly or as hardly understand as the one of that particular animal. So it's really a huge ecology, but every element in the ecology has like its own perspective. And uh, for me, this is really the beauty of like challenging anthropocentrism also like in those artworks. There was a question over there or comment? Hello. <laughs> I was um, um, just thinking about the one time that I've actually seen crocodiles um, was when I was quite young and I was in Florida and they were living in swamps and it was the same area that uh, the Native Americans were also living so they were made into national parks. Um, and I was just um, curious about how how the the fact that we that I and many others see um, crocodiles as belonging in the, the fact that they belong in swamps or I don't know if that's true but that that they do it how they um, how that uh, influence the ah oh, the question uh, but how that influence the the um, the mythology about uh, crocodiles and also if it actually um, changes the the view on the people who live there next to the crocodiles if there's any do they actually um, the image of the native americans and the crocodiles do they some is it a connection there or is it just a, a like a border to civilization area gray zone and that's why it becomes a monster or <laughs> No, I think there is certainly a, a mutual, um, yeah, a kind of dialogue. There is also a, our cultural ecosystems and way of ways of thinking. Our mental infrastructures are, are also informed by the the landscapes we inhabit. So, yeah, I didn't want to explore these kind of questions in depth. But apart from the the more obscene versions that we that we find of hunters and so on in in, in films, there's probably a whole um, history to be written or that, that might already exist of also the, the alligator in, in indigenous culture in, in the south of the United States, for instance, yeah. Okay, now maybe I'm more clear, but the, in, the, in the image that you show also about the explorer some, as coming from the outside and then entering the mysterious landscape, uh, he becomes somebody who who goes there and he experiences something scary and the crocodile is a part of the fear of, of the unknown there. But the people who actually live in these landscapes might have a different view of the crocodile as a mythology, uh, creature of mythology. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. So what you see in the prologue, well, I can only recommend you to, to watch this movie, Taboo by Miguel Gomez. So you see the, the explorer walk towards 
um, yeah, this river where this crocodile is, is waiting, and he's, uh, he's at peace with himself, so he will commit suicide at that point. And right after that, you see his man, which is actually a local tribe, they will, uh, they will celebrate this moment with, uh, with songs and dances. So you see different perspectives pop up and different mythologies also um, in this prologue. Thank you. Oh, I have a question. Um, I was wondering uh, uh, whether uh, the, the, the fact that you use this crocodile as a, 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 gui a guidance uh, or a, a guiding element through uh, the, story sh the story you wanted to tell, um, whether you could have chosen another animal as well. Or sh should it, has it, does it have to be a crocodile? Um, well, yes and no. So this story could only be told through the crocodile, even though I, it remains a superficial um, or a scratching at the surface. So what I said before, I don't think you could construct a similar argument with a rhinoceros or a hippopotamus or with a cat or any other anim animal. So why did I choose the crocodile? Well, it came to me. It's, it's true, actually, the, the Bad Lieutenant film of Werner Herzog and the place of animals in there, and especially also the alligator that I thought, hmm, this notion of the, the conceptual landscape that I'd been talking about for a while, so how can I really address this as an ecology of attention? And rather than look into very many things, I thought, okay, let me just follow the, the alligator for a while. And before I knew, I had a whole stack of material, so I thought, okay, this is a, a good limitation for now. But I could say that, um, the crocodile in this case serves my curiosity as a as a researcher. It's not a question but a comment. I remember Gabrielle in the beginning say that this is a school of visual arts and this notion of the visual analysis or the cognitive was ringing in my head when Maximilian said that um, the alligator is perhaps the animal that we are the least able to identify with. I was visiting friends in New Orleans and we went to an alligator farm and I got the <laughs> pleasure of touching a small child alligator. And unlike what I would imagine for it to be hard and cold and wet, it was soft extremely warm and almost like a kitten. So <laughs> my empathy or my way to relate to the alligator changed. I was, I was obsessed with alligators for weeks after that and I really wanted to go back. I also felt bad. I felt ashamed. And in this you know, intersection of the visual arts touching upon theater, touching upon performance, I would like to make a point of other ways of relating to the world, other than the cognitive or the visual, maybe the sensuous. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more, but it's, I mean, we discussed about this uh, yesterday when we were uh, having dinner that it's actually not so easy to leave the realm of art and still provide this, this experience that, that, we, that we like in, uh, in art perception, actually. I mean, there are quite a lot of projects also um, who, who leave the art space and go or like, on a, like in, in the forest or whatever, but it really changes also the way you per perceive the work. It becomes like in a way pedagogical, it's, it, it's all about the experiences, the experience, but the experience is often not framed as an experience that is actually aesthetic, so you could refer to the concept or whatever, it, it kind of, it kind of loses, loses itself in, in reality and in like personal experience, which is not like communicatable anymore in the way as you would like go to the theater and watch a piece and afterward talk about it and how you liked it and so it's it changes totally and I think we will experience like art changing very much into this direction but th then not maybe having 
art anymore in the way we also like it now, you know? <laughs> I mean, to me still, art is more than touch. But I totally see the point, I mean. Question. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you mentioned the notion of uh, higher animals a few times. Do you have a, a definition of, of that or something you agree with? I mean, that was also to, I mean, I'm not a biologist, actually. I think there is, that's highly debated and stuff like that. For, for Uxkul, where I draw the, 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 the word from, it's every animal that, is, uh, that has like an internal processing of information. There are animals like tiny sea, whatever, fungus, and uh, so if somebody touches on them, then like their tentacles touch each other and so they kind of recognize what's going on and one tentacle reacts to the other as like some swarm intelligence, which is a lower animal. <laughs> and then there is like higher animals who have like a brain, central nervous system and so on. And so you, I mean, more and more you have this, more and more you can also at least guess, because it's, it's what it's all about, guessing, <laughs> that there is some so-called qualia, some, some impressions of, uh, of an outer world that are ac actively produced. So of course it's not like a strict distinction between lower and higher, but I, it, it goes along the complexity of, of uh, information processing, actually. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's more of a comment on the choice of the alligator because uh, for me it really makes sense uh, because it's such a prehistoric animal which has been which hasn't changed so much since, since it's uh, been created or created itself and uh, <laughs> so I think that uh, another like uh, something that could relate to that would be a iguana like uh, in the film of the Ernie Herzog part of uh, or New Orleans, um, there was also a shot which was, uh, that's actually the only shot that I remember very much from the film uh, where the iguana steps in and there, uh, it's a look at the scene through the, from the perspective of the iguana. And um, it's interesting because it's sort of a look at our world through, a, through the eyes of a, animal which has been there for longer than we were. Yeah. Even though, you know, we developed the brain and the thinking and all these things, but maybe it has the perception which is high, more highly developed than our thinking. Yeah. Thanks. Um, 